It's, uh, in this case, a convergence course, but it's also a third-year course here at the uh, TU Delft. And uh, my name is Stefan Luthi. I'm a professor in production geology and petroleum geology here. I'm also department head of uh, the uh, Department of Geotechnology. Um, this is a course that consists entirely of classes, but it'll be quite intensive, and it'll be mostly intensive because we'll be touching on many different fields. You see, petroleum geology is not a basic science. Petroleum geology draws on many different sciences, and we'll try to understand the petroleum system. And for that, you need chemistry, you need physics, you need a little bit of math, you need an awful lot of geology, right? And so for the non-geologists here, I'll go very slowly on that bit and so forth. But it's a combination of, of all of these that actually is important to bring together to understand petroleum systems. Because as you, as you will understand in this course, petroleum systems are very complex. And in fact, they're a hugely exceptional thing to happen in the earth and what I will show you too is that you know we have to care about it for several reasons for one thing because some of us will work in the oil industry others will study the physical system earth and others just worried about the environment but all of us are users of it because for example what you're sitting at just touch the table in front of you. You know what it's made of? Wood? Uh-uh. It's not made of wood. It's plastic, right? I think it's plastic. Yeah? Or at least for a good bit. Yeah? Or the pen you have in your hand. It's plastic. And where's plastic coming from? From petroleum. Right? How did it get to you? You needed energy, right? All right, some of you came on a bicycle. Well, look at the bicycle, what it's made of. Well, most of it is steel, obviously. But there's a lot of plastic on it as well, right? It's in your daily life. Much of your clothing is there and so forth. So it's not just the gasoline we burn in a car. It's a lot more. It's the heating, it's the cooking. It's a lot of the utilities. You know, the bottles, the plastic bottles and so forth. It's all petroleum product. There's about 10,000 different products made of petroleum and they're all over us you know the glasses right just look at it you know it's all over you and so it is very relevant you now what we're talking about to understand this system is one thing to understand the relevance of this system for us and for particularly industrialized nations is another thing and so I'll try to teach you both <coughs> and I'll give you a brief overview of the content and the first thing is white matters. So I already started on that. And I'll give you some basics to show you the size of the industry, which is mind-boggling, but also the volumes we're talking about, which is equally mind-boggling. And I'll also talk about the money involved, which is not just mind-boggling, it's just bewildering. And so we'll, we'll get to see that. I will talk about the history of petroleum, and because actually... You might think, well, it's been around for a long time. No, it hasn't. And so we will see that. Uh, all the really important steps that have been made in the search and the production of petroleum. Then I'll talk about the carbon cycle. That is very relevant because actually the generation of petroleum and what we do with it is actually part of the carbon cycle. How organic matter actually matures into petroleum. I'll talk about the composition of oil and gas. What is it actually? Is it always the same thing? No, the answer is no. It'll, it's a very complex thing and varies from place to place dramatically. Then we will talk about uh, migration from the source where the petroleum is generated to what we call a reservoir, in other words, where we can actually produce it from. Then we'll talk about what the conditions are for the rock where we produce it from to be actually a decent reservoir rock. In other words, a rock that has certain properties that makes it possible for us to extract the fluid. You see, I will, you see later on in the course that most of the petroleum in the subsurface we can actually, we cannot produce. It's not accessible. Well, it's accessible, but it won't flow. And so I'll show you what conditions are 
to actually uh, make it possible for us to extract it from the subsurface. I'll talk about trapping, and that doesn't have anything to do with wolves and foxes in Siberia, but how the oil is actually trapped. Because it can actually flow somewhere in the subsurface, but at one point, it's got to come to a still stand. It's got to be trapped. And there's certain geological conditions that have to be fulfilled for that to happen, and I will talk about those. And you will see, like everything else here in the generation of petroleum, it is an extraordinary con a combination of circumstances that actually leads to a trap. Then I will talk about the larger picture, so-called basins, petroleum basins, such as the North Sea, the Middle East, the Gulf of Mexico, West Africa, uh, South America, and so forth. And why they are so prolific, what the accumulation conditions are, and then how we actually go about exploration and development. And in other words, how do we find out where these traps are, whether the traps contain oil or gas, how much there is in it, and so forth. And we'll also look a little bit at the economics, but very shortly. So <coughs> basically, how do we find and produce oil? That's what this is about. And then we'll talk about some numbers, and particularly the difference between reserves and resources, because that is actually something quite important to know. There is a CEO of a large oil company, Dutch-English oil company, who did not know exactly what the difference is, and he got fired because of that, because he actually claimed reserves, you know, what, what were actually resources as reserves in the books, and uh, that got him fired. So you see, that's relevant, right? And that happened a couple of years ago. It's not too long ago. That's quite relevant. What do you have in the books and what you don't have in the books? Right? What do you think you have in the books? Okay? So, any questions on that? If not, we'll proceed. So, what we really, as an objective of the course, aim at is to give you an overview of this system. But as I said before, this is a complex thing. It's a complex system, and it involves geochemistry, structural geology, sedimentology, mineralogy, fluid mechanics, mapping, volumetric calculations, risk and uncertainty analysis, and a vast array of technologies. There's a tremendous amount of technologies that are being developed. You probably saw them on, uh, on movies, on the reports, on Discovery Channel, these huge structures that are being built, and so forth. There's a tremendous amount of technology around, and some of this technology is so complex that you're really stunned. If you, if you walk into an offshore platform, the driller's place where the driller is, then you'll be stunned. It looks like he's actually operating uh, rockets or space shuttles or something like that. There's computers all over the place, little joysticks. He's, he's all over the place, you, and, and you think, well, a driller, you know, he's basically a big fat guy with a steel helmet and uh, a, a Texan name and a Texan accent, and he swears all the time. Now, these, these people are not doing that. They're very, very well-educated people. They're highly educated engineers, and they operate extremely complicated machinery and instruments. And they better do that right, because there's a lot of money involved. Today, an offshore platform in the deep waters of Brazil costs a million dollars a day a million dollars a day, and if you don't do it right, you may lose a few days. And guess what? Your boss is not going to be happy, because it's going to cost him a lot of money. And so, you know, this technology comes at a price. You know, we can drill it very, very deep, in very deep waters, three kilometers water depth. We can go through seven kilometers of sediments after that, of which two kilometers of salt. It's very difficult to drill through salt, right? And below that, we can find very, very subtle traps that hold actually rather large quantities of oil and gas. But there's a lot of technology and a lot of knowledge involved to, to be able to do that. So I hope I can give you a feeling in this course how <coughs> you can find such, uh, such accumulations and how you develop them. And as probably the most important bit of this course, how they're actually generated. So the objective of this 
course is to obtain the basic knowledge of the origins of petroleum and gas, of the accumulations, and the techniques to find and exploit them. So this should give you a sufficient basis. It's not a really robust basis. We're only talking about seven courses or seven, seven times two hours of lecture. But it's, I think it should be a sufficient basis to, to, for other master's courses in the field, for geophysicists, petroleum engineers, reservoir geologists, here or anywhere else, or even to join a company where in-house training for further uh, knowledge is, is, uh, is provided. All right, so this, this is the basics on the course. TA, that means Technische Arbeitenschap, it's a third year course for our in-house students here, and then for the international students, it's Applied Earth Sciences uh, 3820. So those are the two target groups, and that's one of the reasons why uh, this course is put on uh, College Rama, so that we don't have to repeat that too many times. This is, these are the credits you get for this course. There will be an examination for all students at the end of the course as being <coughs> a requirement to pass the course. Okay, now the course material you get is the PowerPoint presentations on Blackboard, so what I show you here, and on top of that, and I really mean that, is a book uh, mentioned here, Petroleum Geoscience. It's a paperback book. That doesn't mean it's cheap. It's actually still about 60 euros. But it's probably the best, in my eyes, it's the best book on the market. It gives a very broad overview of petroleum systems, but also on field development and field character, uh, reservoir characterization and other topics of relevance. And some of you will take further courses in, uh, in, uh, in petroleum sciences. And so this book is actually not just good for this particular course, but also for subsequent courses that we have. And that includes exploration geology, production geology, and the reservoir characterization for field development. OK, so I recommend this book as uh, uh, a, a basic reference, <coughs> and I'm, you see, when you come across books like that as a lecturer, you're actually very happy because then you, you have a good excuse not to write your own course lecture notes because that's a lot of work, right? And uh, so, and I think, well, you know, this is so professionally done and so well done uh, that I, I believe, you know, the investment in the book is actually worthwhile. It's uh, 360 pages, roughly, and it's, uh, it's uh, very well written. These two authors are, are working in Ireland, and uh, they are professional writers. They're professional scientists, and they know what they're talking about. They have a lot of experience as well. Now, there is more. There are, there's more that might be of interest for you if you want to dig in a little further. And one uh, book that you might also look at is by uh, North, called Petroleum Geology. It's a much thicker book here. It's also a hardcover. Uh, and uh, it's a slightly outdated. This is much more modern, and this is, much, uh, is, is more comprehensive, particularly as far as petroleum uh, geochemistry is concerned. It contains a lot more than that. And then there's a few more books. For those of you who are really interested in the petroleum geochemistry, uh, is the, a very famous book by Tissot and Welte. Uh, it came out in 1978, but there's updates, more recent editions. So it's really updated and uh, you know, pretty much state of the art if you buy the latest edition. It's called Petroleum Information and Occurrence. It's a thick book, but it really has a lot of detail on, on the petroleum uh, geochemistry. My favorite book is written by an American. Leveson. It's written in 1967. You think, well, this is like 40 years ago. You guys weren't even born then, right? But it is so nicely written, and it contains so many nice examples. And actually, some of the field examples I'll show you are from this book. And he explains the system in such simple terms that pretty much everybody can understand it. But it is outdated. and. You know, it is from an almost strictly American point of view, but that is actually a very important point of view because, as I will show you later on, 
the oil industry really is an American industry in its inception and that other countries you know, are very, becoming very important player in this industry is actually relatively new. And so many, many of the new uh, in, initial important insights in uh, petroleum geology have been made by Americans and, uh, and Leveson is one of them. And there's actually, the good thing about this is you get it actually for $20 you get a reprint by the APG, and you got 724 pages for that. So that's per page is probably the best investment in this field that you can make at the APG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists. You can actually buy that. And so if you need more information on it, then uh, I'll be glad to provide that. All right? It's your course. Make the best of it. Ask me questions uh, because this is a complex subject matter. I try to make it as simple as possible, but don't hesitate to ask whenever, whenever it's something you don't understand. Why do we teach this course, and why does that actually affect your daily life? I was recently at a bookstore on the airport in Aberdeen, and that's the oil capital of Europe. And in the bookstore, you think, well, you buy all these you know, cheap novels and stuff like that. But that's not true. They have a whole, whole section, a whole corner is full of books about the oil industry. And I looked at them, and some of them I had already, and some of them I bought. So I came back with these books. There's one of them, The End of Oil by Paul Roberts. Another one, The Oil Depletion Protocol by Richard Heinberg. In other words, about oil wars, how wars or oil, oil fines always have basically generated political instability and wars. <coughs> One that's called The Party's Over, again by Richard Heinberg. It's a bestseller actually in the US. Oil War and the Fate of Industrial Societies. It's not a very, a book that actually makes you feel, feel good at the end of it but it contains some very, very relevant facts. Again, one about political instability and how America's uh, thirst for petrol is killing us. A very critical self-analysis. You think, well, Americans, all they do is drive around in big cars and, 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 and you know, using a lot of petrol. But that's not the case. There's a lot of people who are very critical of that behavior. And I also show you that quite a few European nations are not very different in their behavior and in their consumption of petroleum than uh, North America. Twilight in the Desert, this is an extremely controversial book written by Matt Simmons, who is an investment banker in Houston uh, a couple of years ago, and he claims that the oil reserves of Saudi Arabia are vastly exaggerated. And because these countries do not publicly um, account for their oil reserves, he says that we actually are left in the false security of knowing that there are still these vast reserves in the Middle East and that therefore we don't really look for alternative energies. We think we can still go for a long, long time on these reserves, whereas the Saudis know very well that this is not the case. Obviously, Mr. Siemens doesn't get the visa for Saudi Arabia anymore. But it's, uh, it's an interesting, I don't think he's right, by the way, I don't think he's right, but it's an interesting story also about the history of Saudi Arabia and, and how it came to be what it is, what it is today. <coughs> so, it's relevant. How much oil there is and how much oil is being consumed is relevant. And so I would say, you know, look at some of these books when, if you're interested, read them because they are actually very interesting to read because all of them talk about things that affect us in our daily lives. And what I want to do in this course is I want to put these things, which are obviously written to, to sell books, into perspective of geological history, which is much, much longer term, tens, hundreds of millions of years, right? It took for petroleum to be generated, right? And here we are using it in a very, very short period of time. And so it's very interesting to look at these two time scales, the geological time scale and the human time scale. And that's really why I think it matters. So I'll talk about some 
numbers from the oil industry, but before I do that, I will have to tell you what the units are that the oil industry is, 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 is working with, and those are all English, most of the time, English units, so you have to get used to that. And so the most important unit is a volume, and that's the barrel. The barrel is this thing here, and that's 159 liters. Now, why do we use a barrel well? Because in the U.S., in many of these oil wells they have, they're just producing a few barrels a day, and literally they put these, these barrels there to fill them, and when they're full, then they put the next one there and truck the first one away to be sold somewhere. And so that's where it comes from, although today, of course, we're usually not talking about single barrels. We talk about thousands and millions of barrels. All right? But here in Europe, we try to use the cubic meters, although not with much success, but the conversion is 6.37 barrels equals one cubic meter. And if you're switching to tons, which is also unfortunately used sometimes, then it depends very much on the gravity of oil, how, what the conversion factor is. So for typical oils, that's anywhere between 6.8 and 7.6 barrels would equal one metric ton. So you have to be careful when you're seeing reserves and you have to watch out what exactly what the units are that are being used. Uh, but I would suggest that in the future of this course we stick with barrels because that's what most people are familiar with. And now gas is expressed in millions of cubic feet. So this is one million cubic feet and that's about equivalent to three times ten to the power of four cubic meters. And then energy-wise, and sometimes you see those calculations um, or reserves being indicated in so-called uh, oil equivalents, barrels of oil equivalents, or BOE, as shown here. And one barrel of oil equivalent, so that would be uh, uh, gas, for which you convert the caloric energy content into oil. It would be about 6,000 to 6,500 cubic feet of gas under atmospheric pressures. Okay, so keep in mind the cubic feet and the barrel. Those are the most important things. Because so I'll show you some numbers and then it's useful to know what we're talking about. So a barrel for all those among you is something that you cannot lift yourself. It's really heavy. It's a big thing, right? And so when we talk about reserves, you will see that we're not talking about single barrels. We talk about much more than that. And you will see that we're talking about enormous, enormous volumes. All right, first thing here, some numbers on how many gas and oil wells are being drilled or have been drilled today, seven million. The percentage of wells, of those wells drilled in the US are 50%. It's a lot, because the US covers about 12% or even less of the land surface. That shows you how mature the oil industry actually is in the U.S. It started very early there. It is very much based on individual entrepreneurship. And, and therefore, there's a lot of drilling still going on, so very often by very small companies, fairly shallow, and so forth. The producing wells worldwide are about one million. Out of these seven million, so about one out of seven well produces gas or oil. And the average production of oil wells in the U.S. is about 20 barrels a day, so 20 times this barrel, right? That's the average, and that includes offshore. Okay, so onshore, it's not uncommon for farmers to have basically two barrels, and, you know, as soon as one is full, he trucks it away, and then he puts the other one, and by the time that one's full, he brings the old one back, and then, so that's what he does. And if you have a production of two barrels of oil a day on your farm and you get $70, you actually get $140 per day and that's actually not an unwelcome income for many people and if you earn more than that then that's even more welcome. Now if you compare that to the production of oil wells in the Middle East, those are on average 7,000 barrels of oil a day. I've worked in Iran for two years and I've seen wells producing 100,000 barrels of oil a day. 100,000 barrels of oil a day. Are there any Dutch people here? 
Yeah? yeah? What's the daily production in the Netherlands? Do you know that? Of oil? All the Netherlands. Um, 100,000? That would be nice, huh? 100,000 <laughs> would be nice. It's actually 20,000 barrels. It actually was very close to 100,000 barrels. That's not bad, right? That was about 15 years ago. And it's now 20,000 barrels of oil a day. So there are, there are wells in this world that actually produce five times the production of the Netherlands. Just one well, one single well, right? So, enormous quantities, right? We'll get to why these wells produce so much, what the conditions have to be to produce so much, and why most of these wells, these very productive wells, are found in the Middle East. But it just shows you, and it shows you a bit the, uh, you know, the relationship, and we'll try to understand why we have these enormous, <coughs> enormous uh, differences in well productivity. Then we have the total number of producing fields is about 40,000. Many of them are very, very small, just one, two, three wells. And what's, of course, very important is the total number of petroleum geologists, that's 100,000. And that's actually not including the Chinese, because we had the Chinese, we'd actually have two million more. But that is the worldwide population of ge petroleum geologists outside of China. And the total number of drigs, uh, drill rigs worldwide is about 5,000. And those include offshore platforms. Most of them are onshore land rigs. And, uh, and those are uh, about one third of those are currently active. And two thirds are not active. And that's a very good measure of the state of the oil industry. If all those are active, then you're in a boom time as far as the oil industry is concerned, and when very, li very few of them are active, then you're uh, not in a boom time. You're going through a more difficult time. And so, and that's what we're going through right now. Okay, so I'll uh, confront you with a few more large numbers. And now we're talking about billion barrels of oil, okay? So a billion barrel of oil is actually 10 to the power 9, okay? So just make sure you're not, because in Dutch and in German, those are actually uh, different. That would be a milliard in Dutch, huh? Okay, the annual world consumption in 2008 is 30 billion barrels of oil. Now, this is very difficult for, also for me, to really imagine this. You know how much that is, and uh, so I'm not going to tell you well it's so and so many ship, ships full of oil, or or you could actually cover the Netherlands with you know five meters of oil with that or stuff like that. So I I never made that calculation by the way, but it's 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 a it's a lot I can tell you that, and the annual oil discovery rates in the 1990s and 2000s are between four and eight billion barrels of oil a day. So what do you conclude from these two numbers? No, that's per year. That's the annual oil discovery rate. Okay. Consumption is greater than the discovery, okay? Well, you don't need to be a genius to figure that out, but it's important to realize that. In fact, it is much more, much higher, yeah? Okay, now we'll get to the consequences of that. Now, the total world oil consumption from 1860 to 2008, and 1860 is kind of the start of, of the oil industry. So we'll get to that when we talk about the history. <coughs> So we're talking about roughly 150 years, okay? Is 1,050 billion barrels or 1 trillion, a little over 1 trillion barrels of oil. The reserves calculated by a variety of people, which I'll show you here. This is actually an estimate by Mr. Campbell and La Herrera in 1998, but still quoted very widely. Conventional world oil reserves are 850 billion barrels. 
So if you compare these two, that would lead you to the conclusion that we'll pass the peak. Okay? So we've used more than half of the reserves. But watch out. You know, you have to be careful when you're talking to guys who make these kind of calculations, including to me. Conventional, that's the key, key word here, right? In fact, what they mean is so-called easy oil, oil that you can drill and produce quite easily, that flows by itself. You don't even sometimes have to put pumps in it, right? That is, uh, has a, <coughs> a good enough viscosity to be easily produced at rates that are economically uh, feasible. More numbers? This is actually a number by the BP Statistical Review in 2007, very recent. The more recent number, 2008, also is out, and it's not very different. It's about 1.4 trillion barrels of oil. So that's already quite a bit different from here. And so if we compare these two numbers, then we see that you know, we're not past the halfway point. Again, these are conventional oil reserves, but they actually include some heavy oil in Canada. Uh, most of you have heard about the uh, heavy oil, or tar sands as they're sometimes called, in Alberta, around uh, Fort McMurray. And uh, at one point, the technology has been su successively advanced to a point where you can actually produce that pretty much as conventional oil. And so, a few years ago, those reserves were actually booked. 164 billion barrels of oil sands in Canada have been added to so-called conventional reserves. Well, we get to that later on. But you see the global picture becomes quite different if you look at that. Now, here's a third number, and that's from the U.S. Geological Survey in 2000, 2000, has been updated recently, and it's pretty much still the same number, and that's 2.3 trillion barrels of oil, conventional oil reserves. Now, there's a very different picture emerging here, as you can see, that actually means that we have at least twice as much as we already used in the first 150 years of massive oil consumption. We still have about two and a half times more to go. Now, there's, a, of course, a footnote here that also says, well, this estimate actually includes about 700 billion barrels of oil of reserve growth that is actually uh, a term used to describe reserves that are in existing fields and that will be accessible with improved technology. And it has to do with a so-called recovery factor. Today we recover about one-third of the uh, you know, oil in situ in a place, in a field, but if you improve the uh, technology sufficiently, then you can actually raise that to almost 50%. That's called reserve growth. And <clears throat> there's also 700, more than 700 billion barrels of undiscovered reserves. And you say, well, how can you call something reserves if you haven't discovered it yet? But that's actually not as silly as it may look, because there are basins in this world that are essentially underexplored. We know very little about it. And one of the biggest basins, of course, is the Arctic Ocean. In fact, it's not one basin, it's about 13 different basins. It's a very complex, complex entity. And, and, and what the USGS does is it looks at the Arctic Ocean and says, classifies the different basins by analogy with known basin and basins and says, well, according to our experience in a basin of that style, we actually can expect so and so much oil in this particular basin. And they add that up and they say, for example, in the Arctic, they say we'll probably have about 100 billion barrels of oil to be discovered. Right, and they add other basins up. There's big basins onshore, like the Tarim Basin in China. It's almost unexplored, very difficult to access. It's a very big basin in the, uh, in the western province of Xinjiang, right? It's basically one big desert, the Taklamaklan Desert, right? It's very difficult to shoot seismic because of very high uh, dunes, right? And so very little is known about the subsurface. And so it is, as far as that's concerned, an, an unexplored 
basin, but it has, it holds the potential of holding significant reserves. So what you do is, in these calculations, you just add these basins one by one, you add them up to get these undiscovered reserves. So that's a, quite a reasonable way of doing it, but in all honesty, I think this number here is politically motivated. Uh, it was actually at a time when in America, this was before the, the current administration, when essentially the energy policy of the U.S. Is, was to rely on oil and oil and oil. And so what they wanted to hear, what the administration wanted to hear from their geological survey, basically is good news. Please give us good news. And so, you know, there's a lot of politics involved in these numbers, right, in all of them, right? You see these are sort of doomsdayers here, and they are optimists. They're told to be optimists, right, by the government, basically, to put things uh, a, bit, uh, a bit crudely. Okay, we talked about conventional oil reserves. Now, we, talk, we add the unconventional oil reserves, and these are heavy oil, tar sands, and oil shales. And there is another 1.9 trillion of barrels of oil. They're known. We know where they are. They're in Venezuela, and they're in Canada, and they're in Siberia. And they're actually, you know, we have a field about 10 kilometers from here, a place called Murkapelle, that is also, we know how much there is in it, right? At the current time, at the current economic level of, of the oil price, it's not worthwhile to produce it. But the oil is there, we know. We, can pr we could produce it if we wanted to. And so, you know, that's this number here. Now, if you are an optimist and you say, well, all of this here is actually realistic, and this is around, so you have f that makes you 4.2 trillion barrels of oil around, and that's what we used so far. So we've got four times more than we used so far in terms of oil, right? And even if you're a pessimist, and you say, well, I'd rather believe this number here and rather not produce all of this here, then you'd still have quite a bit of oil reserves left. And so, you know, this is a basic message you can derive from this, uh, these numbers. You know, if your mother or your grandmother asks you, so where, when are we running out of oil? The answer is not very soon, because we still have plenty of reserves. That's, the, that's the, the proper answer, but actually it's not a real relevant answer because the, the really the important question is when do we have a shortage of oil? That's the relevant question. And then you should tell your grandmother, well, that actually might happen very soon because consumption's going up, and I'll show you some numbers, and production goes up, but perhaps not as, not as fast as we'd like to, and so at one point, maybe in the very near future, there might be a shortage of oil. And that's very good news for you guys if you're planning to go into the oil industry because it's getting more and more difficult to find oil, right? This oil down here, but also to produce this oil here. We need petroleum engineers, very smart petroleum engineers, to do a good job on this one here. We need very good geophysicists and geologists to actually find oil in undiscovered places, right? So the message here is, you know, people with good skills will be needed more than ever in this industry because that demand will not slow down anytime soon. Right, so that's the kind of lessons we learn from, from these numbers. And uh, this is not a rosy picture or anything. I, I, I think it's actually quite a balanced picture I tried to, to present to you, but if you think otherwise, then I'll, I'll, be, glad, I'll be glad to hear it. But I'll show you, too, are um, some numbers on the oil companies in this business. And you're talking about the very largest companies worldwide, with a few exceptions. Here's ExxonMobil, the biggest oil company, and that's, those are numbers for 2007, and their production was 4.2 million barrels of oil equivalent. You see here comes this oil equivalent, so that's gas and oil combined, right? And what are their reserves? Their reserves are 12.6 billion barrels of oil equivalent. So you can make a very simple calculation, a division uh, of this by that, and you'll get a time. How much time can they actually 
go continue with these reserves. And that's the so-called RP ratio, so reserves divided by production, and that gives you 8.2 years. All right, and then we're looking at the revenues, and these are staggering numbers, $464 billion in 2007 with a net income of a little over 10%. Well, that's a very nice net income by all standards. And if you're looking, and the staff is in excess of 100,000 employees worldwide, right? Big, big companies, all right? BP, second largest. And now, what, if you look at these numbers, look at how amazingly similar they are, all right? Almost exactly the same, and here the net income is a little lower. That has a little bit to do with the way BP does business. You look at Royal Shell, right? A they're a little smaller than BP. Their reserves are smaller. That's something that they're really concerned about. And if you divide, if you calculate the R&P ratio, then you're getting five years. I'll get back to that. These are the revenues, very large revenues, very large net income. Right? These are you know, revenues that are you know, in excess of most you know, national gross products of, of most countries. And then employees are 104,000, and that's probably going to go down quite a bit now. They're sort of restructuring, if I understand it right. And then Chevron is here, and Total, the French company, a merger between Total and El Fakitan, is here. And what you see is that their reserves typically are not really very large, and particularly this RMP ratio looks very, very low. Right? So that could be actually cause for worries. But then it worried, because if you look at it historically, it's always been that way. They've always had between 5 and 15 years reserves left, because they constantly dis make new discoveries or acquire new reserves, and they produce. So it's like a sliding window. They're always moving with these reserves. In fact, they don't want to have much more than that. And so this is not something to worry about, except if they don't get access to new reserves anymore. And that is something they worry about. Because about 85% of the oil in this world, these companies don't have access to. They're in the hands of nationals. And here are the nationals. The biggest one, Saudi Arabia, here. See, the foreign companies don't have access to that oil, right? There's the production, that's 2007, 10.8 million barrels of oil a day. That's just oil, no gas here, right? It's difficult to get numbers from many of these countries, okay? So it actually took, takes me quite a while to compile this list here, right? The reserves are 264 billion barrels. If you make a calculation of the R over P, that's about 67 years. So at the current rate of production, Saudi Arabia can easily continue for close to 70 years. And if we go through that, so we look at China, much smaller production here, much smaller reserves. That's cause for worry, 17 years. Guess why the Chinese go to Sudan? Guess why the Chinese go to Angola? Guess why the Chinese go to South America to try to make deals? Here's the, here's the reason why. Right? They, need, they need access to oil. Right? Pemex, that's a highly contested number, a Mexican company. Uh, this number here is probably about the factor of 10 too small. That's the one that the Americans produce, but the Mexicans themselves, they can quote much higher numbers. So that's a highly unreliable number here. If we look at Iran, look at these numbers here, 86 years to go. Iraq, well, they have a very small production right now, for obvious reasons. 240 years to go with the current, current production. And then we look at Abu Dhabi down here, 90 years, Kuwait, 126 years, Libya, 62 years, and so forth. That's all in the Middle East. Right? That's where the big reserves are. For them, the future of the country relies heavily on this. And so they're not <coughs> going to increase their production anytime soon because their, the income, the national income, the economy depends very, very strongly on this here. In many of these countries, it, it depends entirely on the income from oil production. And so their interest is not to make quick money. Their interest is to extend this here as far as possible into the future. You see, and these are, you know, these are 
controversial or these are diff different strategies and policies than these companies have because these companies they want to maximize this number here right and these companies they want to maximize this number here so it's it's interesting to know and I'll stop at that I'll continue in uh, in uh, 15 minutes with the second half of this talk so we'll stop here thank you So uh, I'll uh, show you a few statistics, global st statistics on uh, reserves and consumption. And I think it's always good to get the, uh, the overall picture before moving on to the nitty gritty details of uh, you know, the uh, geochemistry and, uh, and geology. And so here uh, I show you numbers from the BP statistical review, which is as far as that's concerned, probably the most reliable source for information as far as production and consumption uh, and reserves is concerned for oil, gas and, and coal and nuclear fuels, by the way. And so <clears throat> here we look at, that's their numbers, so it's 1.3 trillion, that's, that's their quoted numbers, right? So and 750 billion of that is in the Middle East, that's this area here, defined as this area here, so it includes Iran but doesn't include Egypt and Turkey. And then the next one is Europe and Eurasia. And so among, for the Europeans among you, don't think it's in your backyard. It's actually most of this is in Russia and in Kazakhstan. 144 billion barrels. And then we're going down Africa here. Most of it is actually in Algeria. Uh, Angola and Nigeria. Then we have South and Central America. Most of that would be in Venezuela and a growing number would actually be in, in Brazil with all these recent discoveries. The, for example, the latest discovery, the Tupi field in Brazil, which is in very, very deep water and extremely difficult to drill, is probably around 7 billion barrels. So that number here would be increased from 103.5 to 110.5 with that find. Then here is North America, so that's very small numbers as you can see, 60 million billion barrels. And the Asia Pacific region, which is this one here, that actually includes two of the uh, largest nations here, China and India, and including Indonesia and Australia, has a mere 40 billion barrels of oil. So this is the picture. You see the overwhelming importance of the Middle East. Uh, we're looking at the production. And these are the same colors. They're all green and yellow. I presume to make easy distinctions. And uh, we uh, see here, so this light green here is the Middle East. And you see that most of its production from 1981 to 2006 here has come from the Middle East. And then we have North America down here. What we see is a decreasing trend. We see South and Central America. It's slightly increasing, but a relatively small, small number. Europe and Eurasia. And this is, uh, uh, most of it is from uh, here, the Soviet Union, and then Russia, Kazakhstan, and a few other former Soviet Unions. And you see that it went actually through a a minimum here and it started increasing again and that's when Russia started using Western technologies in their fields and so they, these fields became a lot more productive once Western technology was used. And then up here we see Africa slightly increasing and Asia Pacific again slightly increasing with the majority of this here actually coming from Indonesia and from China. And so what you see is the overall, so a little dip here in the overall production, as you can see here, it had to do with an economic and political problems in the late 1970s, and then there's an increase here, very steady increase at about one to two billion barrels <coughs> per year. And so you see that actually 
increases very steadily. And if you look very carefully at, at these sub-segments here, then you see that practically the whole increase has been carried by the Middle East. And that's what we call swing producers. So we expect, by consuming more, we expect the Middle East to actually increase their production. And that has been in the past, indeed has been the case, and notably Saudi Arabia has fulfilled this role actually in a surprisingly reliable way. Whether that's going to continue in the future is a big question mark. All right, so if you look at this RP ratio, remember the RP ratio? Right, so here is the world from 1982 to 2006. And you'd think, well, that R, R over P ratio surely must have decreased because we're, we're consuming, right? And so the R diminishes, right? Because we, we have less and less. And so, but actually what happens is it increased and then it stayed pretty much above 40. Overall, so the whole world, in other words, always had over the last at least 20 years, always an R and P ratio of 40. So that actually means that's a pretty meaningless statistic, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, because we have an R and P, R over P here of 40, that we have 40 years to go. No, because it actually, you know, it, you know, it, it varies. It actually went down a little bit. I told you the discoveries in the 90, 1990s and 2000s are actually are fairly, uh, a fair bit smaller than the production. So it actually went down a little bit. But that's a relative, has a relatively small impact on the overall picture. And so what looks like a disastrous small exploration success actually on the overall picture doesn't really have much impact. And so what you see is that there's a surprising stability in this number here. Then if you, if you subdivide it into, into the different areas, regions of the world, then you see obviously that you know, the Middle East has by far the largest number, R over P ratio, and some of these areas here, notably Europe and Asia Pacific have the smallest, the smallest values for obvious reasons. All right, then let's look at the consumption by area. So again, the same colors. Then we see North America being very dominant and Europe and Eurasia. Uh, what's surprising here is the consumption has actually remained, and that's just oil, okay? It's not gas or other fuels. We'll get to that in a minute. So it's been fairly constant. It's gone down a little bit in North America, but it's increased very slightly, but not very much. And if you look at Europe, it's actually gone down. Europe and Eurasia, we're actually consuming less oil than we did 20 years ago, right? It works. Insulating houses works, driving smaller cars works, you know, that's the proof right here. You can do it, right? Well, if you look at, conversely, you know, if you look at Asia Pacific, and then we're talking mostly about India and China as being the most populous countries, we see a twofold increase from, the 1982, from 1982 to the current years, we see at least a twofold increase and perhaps even more than that. So in other words, almost the entire increase in oil consumption over the last 20 and 25 years is attributed to this region here. If you look at this number here, it's fairly level, right? Some use a little bit more, others use a little bit less, but by and large, it's compensated. So there's only one region in this world that actually has a dramatic increase in the oil consumption. Now, if we look at consumption per capita, which is a completely different story, right, you get a very surprising picture. So all of, all of us know that Americans, they're the big gas guzzlers, right? Of course, yes. We like to think in terms of simple pictures. And of course, yes, and then we look at it, and then you see, indeed, yes, the darkest green, where that's where the highest, the highest uh, consumption takes place, and that's actually the annual consumption in tons per year. So what this actually means is roughly comes down to about 10 liters of oil per person per day. That's what it comes down to, roughly, yeah, per person. All right, and if we look at 
Western Europe, then we see a surprising picture, namely there's three little dark spots. And one of them is Iceland, and the other ones are in here, and that's Belgium and the Netherlands. And they have exactly the same color as North America. Yeah? And usually Dutch people say, there must be a mistake. Right? It can't be true. We are so energy conscious. We use a lot of gas. We don't use a lot of oil. It's not true. Dutch people are very mobile. Whenever they have a free weekend, they fly to Barcelona, right? Or they drive to Limburg or wherever they go. There's a lot of shipping going on here. That is included in these numbers as well. You know, ships are big gas cutlers, right? And so forth, right? Plus, there are hardly any other alternatives. Only gas as a second source of energy here, right? But, you know, nuclear energy, hydroelectric power and so forth, they're very small. Right? If you look at the so-called alternative energies used here, it's 7.5% this year. 7.5% of the total energy consumption. And of those 7.5%, 4% are nuclear energy. That's this one power plant there is in uh, Zeeland, the Borsele power plant. Counts for 4% of the energy consumption. Now, if you want to call that alternative energy, feel free to do so, but I don't. So there's 3.5% left, and that's wind energy mostly. It's one third, one, one thirtieth, right? That's all there is, right? And so all the rest is oil and gas, right? And some coal. There's also coal-fired power plants, right? So and that, that's really what accounts for that, whereas many of these countries here have a significant amount of other energy sources, such as, of course, the Scandinavian countries. They are cold countries, so you'd think, well, their energy consumption you know, must be higher. Yes, it is, but not in oil, because they have hydroelectric power plants. Some of them have very extensive wind uh, 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 windmill plants and so forth. The uh, countries in the Alps also have a lot of hydroelectric power and countries like Germany and Britain they have a much greater diversity of, of uh, energy sources than, uh, than the low countries have here and so that's why as far as oil consumption is concerned this is just oil I'm looking at, right? You know, it's actually their highest in Europe If we look at the total world consumption, distributed or split up into different uh, sources of energy, then we see that you know this is the total consumption here, and it is in million tons of oil equivalent. So everything's been converted into oil equivalents. Okay, and so down here we see oil, and that's good for about one third. Then we see natural gas. That's good for about a fourth. Then we see nuclear right here, hydroelectric, and coal. And if you want to be friendly by looking at this graph and you say, so what are really the sustainable energies, then there's only one, and that's the blue one, of course, and that's hydroelectric power here. And what's not included here is solar energy and geothermal energy, wind energy, heat, and so forth. That's not included here. If you add that, so those are the other, say, sustainable energies, right? Would actually add 10% on top of that. You'll be up here. All right, and so the reason why I show this is that 85% of our energy consumption is fossil fuels, is coal, gas, and oil. And I asked at the beginning of this course, why it matters, and this is why it matters. It's a good reason to understand that. It's a good reason to get a global picture before you go into the technical details of how oil and gas is actually generated. And so it's very important. This, there's a lot of inertia in this. You don't switch the whole world from a dependence of 85% fossil fuels to alternative fuels in a few years. You don't. There's an enormous investment in terms of power plants, in terms of cars, and in terms of heating systems, and in terms of God knows what. And you don't switch that from 
one day to another or even within a few decades. You don't do that. There's a lot of inertia in it and that means actually that's, you know, and as you see, you know, these things change very, very slowly through time and practically all of them grow, right? And so those are investments and they are usually written off over 50 years. That's typical like for a coal-fired power plant. You build it for 50 years. So the Chinese build one coal-fired power plant every week. That's what they do. And some people say two per week, one per week. Those are investments for the next 50 years. Don't think that they're going to do away with it in 10 years. No, no, they, they'll be around for the next 50 years because they're big, big, big investments, right? And so this picture is not going to change any time soon. Right? Because he can't. It's extremely difficult to, to change that. So you can listen to people talking about alternative energies and that all sounds very good and very nice. And something has to happen, but there's such an inertia in our consumption pattern and the investment that goes with it that it's very difficult to change it. And you know, with all these big investments in wind, geothermal and so forth, you know, it hardly made a difference in the total picture. It's up here, right? And don't forget that much of that, much of that is actually attributed to one continent alone, and that's Africa. Because in Africa, a major fuel is actually wood and dung, right? But it's actually significant, right? And it's sustainable for the most part, right? Now, it's been used for many, many centuries, of course, right? So that actually includes, is included in these numbers up here, right? So, you know, this, these are, you know, the proportions are really quite, quite, quite important to keep in mind. All right, so if you look at the total energy consumption, right, so not just oil, well, I probably forgot to mention before, you know, there's actually another region that's pretty good, you know, doing pretty good in terms of energy consumption, and that's the Middle East. And they're driving, they like to drive nice big cars, they also live in a very hot climate, and they have access to very cheap energy, so they have huge air conditioning systems and so forth, and that's really what accounts for uh, the uh, high energy consumption here in the Gulf states, um, including, of course, Saudi Arabia. And it's at the same level as uh, same level as the low countries, Iceland and uh, North America here. If you look at the total energy consumption, right, which actually has often been correlated very positively with the living standards, then you see that you know this this is very dark here, and then you see well, yeah here low countries they're they're still in there hanging in there. Right, Iceland is still hanging in there. Now you see Norway. Now you see the true energy consumption here. Well, much of it is hydroelectric, right? Saudi Arabia is still in there. Russia too, because it's a cold country. They need to, to, uh, to keep their houses warm in the winter. And Australia needs to keep the houses cool in the summers. And so that's what accounts for this. You know, there's two belts, right? Uh, two belts, basically, the northern southern ones, and then in the middle, in the uh, if they can afford it, you know, and so obviously here, that's, that's really quite exceptional. What what happens in the Middle East is really quite exceptional. But if you look at Europe, you see very big differences, and that's the difference. Not you know, the, the, the 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 social products, small gross social products of most of these countries is very comparable per capita, right? But you see that some countries clearly have lower energy consumptions than others, right? And you see, for instance, Great Britain, you see uh, Germany. Well, no, you don't see Germany. You see Poland here having a lower one, Portugal having a lower one, and so forth. Some even had a very, very lower one, the uh, former Yugoslav Republic. They, of course, have a very nice Mediterranean climate, but they have also been a former East European uh, country that is now uh, you know, becoming more industrialized, and so they're still are doing some catching up. But you know, the climate actually can make quite a difference. And so you see huge differences in the total energy consumption. And, uh, and uh, that's one of the challenges to actually find a good match for each of these countries uh, in terms of 
in terms of their choices for, for, for energies. All right, so I will just look at the overall picture, oil, gas, and coal. Here, uh, you probably can't read that, but you can you know, you have access to that on Blackboard. I won't go into detail, but there is reserve. We, we've seen them uh, uh, a bit in, uh, in summary fashion for oil. But what I look at here is this R over P ratio again. And that's for oil, it's 45 years. For gas, it's 75 years, roughly. And for coal, it's 185 years. And that's why many countries, when they're looking at the choices for energies, they realize two things. One, there's a lot of inertia. And two, there's a lot of coal. And that's why many countries choose for coal-fired power plants these days. And for those of you who are worried about the environment, of course, that's pretty much the worst choice you can make. But if you don't have a choice, then that's what you have to go with. Right? And that's gas would be the best one, but not everybody has access to to affordable gas and oil is has the lowest RMP ratio but all as we have seen this has been the same for the last 20 years and so it's really a static measure with little predictive value but it's a very simple metric with a message and the message here is there's more coal than oil it, it's a much more long-term option coal than oil Sadly, but that's just that's just a fact. All right. So now, in the second, the last half of this uh, of this uh, lecture, I will talk a little bit about the historical development of of the oil industry, and uh, it, it may be quite interesting for you to realize that it's actually a relatively young industry, and it had to do with the fact that people really didn't know what to do with oil, because you now. When I worked in Iran, I saw these very old fields, which were discovered in 19, early 1900s. And actually, people had, they knew there was oil there. They knew 5,000 years before Christ, they knew there was oil. And they used it, actually. They used the seepages of asphalt as mortar for their houses. So it's not really new, right? It has been used for a long, long time. And and I'll explain in a minute why that has changed so dramatically. But, you know, there have been, these seepages have been around throughout the world. In the Appalachians, you know, even the Athabascan Indians, they knew about the heavy oil in, in, uh, in Alberta. And they used it, actually, to waterproof their canoes. Right? So they knew about it, and it's been used, but not at an industrial scale. California has very famous oil seeps in Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, Ploesti, that's in Romania, uh, in Peru. The Incas actually knew about it, the old Egyptians knew about it, and Borneo, natives in Borneo, they knew about it, they used it, but not, not nearly on industrial scale. They didn't, certainly didn't know where it came from and what, what it was. So nobody really understood what petroleum was. It's called earth oil. Petroleum means earth oil, right? What was known prior to 1900s was the anticlinal theory. That in theory, if you had a structure that looks like an anticline, an anticline is an upward arched geological layer. Right? We'll see a few examples later on. Right? Then that this might actually form a trap for oil or for gas or for air or anything. Well, it's a very simple physical principle. Everybody understands that. Right? But it wasn't known in practice, it wasn't used in practice. So many fields are located in so-called geomorphic traps, oil fields, where you could actually dig it out. So a geomorphic trap is where you have dipping layers like this, and then they're cut by an erosion surface, and a tight layer comes to lie across it. And then the oil gets trapped. And if that's at sufficiently shallow depth, you can actually dig down into it. The Chinese did that. You know, the Chinese were digging wells up to 300 meters deep before any well had ever been drilled in the Western world, right? They were going down, digging, right? For salt, mostly, but sometimes also for oil, right? But not on an industrial scale. So Drake, Colonel Drake, he drilled in 1859, uh, pretty much 150 years ago. There was actually a celebration just recently on that. The first oil well in a place called Titusville, Pennsylvania, which wasn't very deep. It was actually only about 30 feet deep took him about three months to drill it. So it, they drilled roughly one foot per day. 
this much per day, right? Today, with modern technology, it takes us about 10 seconds to drill this much, right? We drill typically about between 100 and 500 feet a day, at least, and some of them drill 100 feet an hour or 200 feet an hour, very, very, very quickly. So, yeah, this, it just took him very long, a uh, very long time to do that, but it was actually a drill rig, and it was an operation, uh, you know, and obviously he was discovered, you know, he was considered a complete, a complete nuthead, because they said, yeah, what are you looking for, you know, and he said, well, I'm drilling for oil. I said, oil? What good is oil for, right? So, he found oil, and actually that was led to the first boom in Pennsylvania, and <coughs> Nobody really knew what to do with oil because a few things didn't really exist yet, namely cars didn't exist yet. The internal combustion engine wasn't invented yet. Well, it was invented in theory. Mr. Otto actually invented that in Germany in the in 1900s, uh, in the 19th century, but there wasn't any fuel around on a large scale to actually use it. All right. In 1900, somebody very smart, and he was a geologist, believe me or not, he actually put the anticlinal theory in practice, and he said, there is a structure, a geological structure, in an area called Spindle Top in Texas. I know it, and there must be oil in it. And so they drilled for it with relatively modern technology at that time. They discovered one of the biggest oil fields in, in Texas, and at that time it was actually a sign of luck and joy and success to actually let it flow out first, you know, as a blowout, to let it flow out. Everybody got, got wet and black and, and, and the whole area got messed up, but that was actually, people were very happy when that happened yeah. and that probably wouldn't be approved these days by the environmental agencies anymore. And subsequent to that, very important discoveries were made in Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela, Masjid Suleiman, the first oil field in Iran. Here's a picture of the Masjid Suleiman field, 19, or at least the, the town of Masjid Suleiman, and it still produces. We're 101 years later, and this field still produces, and it produces about 100,000 barrels of oil a day. Trinidad, Borneo, Mexico, Oklahoma, the San Joaquin Valley in California, and so forth. <coughs> All of this basically was done by Americans. They had the knowledge, they had the early discoveries, they started understanding the system and so forth. Nothing happened in Europe, nothing happened in Africa, nothing happened in Asia, not by the locals. It may have happened by expat Americans. So the American Association of Petroleum Geologists was founded. and. <coughs> The first offshore field was discovered, the Bolivar field, in uh, Venezuela, and its large, first large field with heavy oil. And the first major oil company, Standard Oil, was uh, 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 was founded. Actually, they they became big because of all these discoveries here. Right, that's a very famous family that still plays a major role in American, in the American economy. Who owned that? And that's the Rockefeller family. That's the way they became rich. But very soon after they, they became dominant, they actually had to be split up uh, for um, anti-lobbying reasons. And uh, so right now, Chevron, Mobil, Texaco and so forth, they're all actually, they came out of Exxon. So Esso, you see Esso, Exxon, right, that's Esso, right? So Exxon was, is the continuation of Standard Oil, right? It's just written differently, Exxon or Esso in this country here, right? But all the other, the other companies, Texaco, Mobil and so forth, they're all spin-offs, right? So the, the US government said you can't dominate the industry in a way you do that, but you actually have to split up, there's no monopolies allowed. And so there has to be competition, and so all these baby SOs 
were, uh, were launched and of course I showed you before that <coughs> many of them still play a major role in uh, today's times. Now, so what that really means, what that really meant, these are your grand grandfathers and great grandfathers who lived through that. You know, oil become wide, became widely available. And initially, people didn't really know what to do with it other than to burn it, right? Gas stoves, right? But then finally, you know, people actually realized you, know, you didn't want to use gasoline in your gas stoves, ways to explode. So you don't want to have these housewives carrying around, you know, gasoline in buckets and, you know, there's an open flame somewhere in, an, you know, um, somewhere in the kitchen and then the whole thing blows up. You don't want to do that, right? So they actually used mostly kerosene and heavier fuels. That was the good stuff at that time. And the lighter components of, of, of petroleum, they, they were really considered too dangerous. And so they, they weren't really used at that time. But with the invention and the widespread use, availability of, of, of cars, and mostly Ford T cars, of course, that's the famous example, you know, cars became available to broader public, and so there was actually use for gasoline. Uh, that may sound a little strange, but, you know, that's, that's really the first time that there was any use for gasoline. Okay? And so, and this was perhaps as far as, you know, the use of petroleum is concerned, probably the most important, important period. Now after that, 1925 and so forth, up to the Second World War, very big fields were discovered in the Middle East, but also in Venezuela, and for the first time really very large carbonate reservoirs. Well, the Master Suleiman's carbonate reservoir, but Kirkuk is, is, a, is a much larger field. And as you know, there's still fighting going on today about this particular field here. But a very important insight was made, namely, that oil is organic and not inorganic. That it actually came from living matter originally. And those are geochemists who made that discovery. So micro micropaleontology became important, organic geochemistry became important to actually be able to predict where oil could be found. And so this was the beginning of understanding the system. You had a major insight, it is organic, right? You needed some deposits that were organic rich to actually be able to form oil and so forth. And so that was important. And there was also at the same time very important technological breakthroughs. And perhaps the most important one is rotary drilling. Before, the way they drilled was basically by hacking down with a sharp chisel and, and then ever so often flushing whatever has been broken up to the surface. Right? Rotary drilling is a much more sophisticated method whereby you have a drill bit that rotates and you actually have inside, you have a mud stream going down inside the pipe, going through the drill bit and going up on the outside of the drill string, taking with it all the broken stuff, which we call cuttings, right, to the surface. You filter that, right, and then the rest of the mud goes back into the, the drill pipe. And so this way, you could continually actually drill, drill and clean the well from all the debris. And there's a lot of geophysical stuff that actually was developed then. Torsion balance, gravimeters, reflection seismology, electrical well logs, and perforations, which was important. Perforating means that you're actually, you have a casing, you have cement behind it, and you perforate those zones that you want to produce. And wells could be drilled up to about 3,000 meters deep. Before, that was only possible to about 1,000 meters. So this is this period here, just before the Second World War. Of course, in the Second World War, there was a tremendous need for fuels. And so there's a lot of drilling going on at that time. And as you probably know, the Germans, they went to Russia, not because they liked the Russians or so forth, or because they liked cold climates. No, they wanted to get access to the oil fields in southern Russia, because they had a need to, to, have, to have fuels to, to provide, you know, supply the army. With, uh, with fuels, and uh, that of course wasn't very successful, but that's where some of the very early fields in, uh, in, uh, in Russia were, were developed, and that, that includes all the fields in uh, Chechnya. Well, the World Petroleum Congress was founded, not that that is very relevant to you guys, but I actually happen to be a member of that, so for me that's important. Then 1945 to 1960, after the Second World War, 
big drilling boom in the Middle East. Many of the large oil fields were discovered uh, there and also in the US, Western Canada, Russia, simply because actually as part of a spin-off of the Second World War, a lot of new technology had become available. And so it was possible to drill much deeper, to go further into you know, hostile countries or, or very uh, difficult you know, c countries with difficult access, permafrost and so forth. So Canada, Russia and so forth. And it was possible to drill there as well. So could drill up to about 6,000 meters and that's typically a depth where you find more gas than oil. So as of a sudden, gas became available. And here, in 1959, so that's in this period here, towards the end of this period, the Groningen gas field was, was discovered. Right? It's the biggest gas field in Europe. Right? It's in this country. Right? So it's very big. And it was discovered here. And initially, they really didn't know what to do with this gas, because they had cars. Yeah. They ran on gasoline, not on gas, right? And there was no distribution network. And so it's a very important decision of this government, or the government then in the Netherlands, to actually say, well, we consider gas a very important fuel. And what we'll do is we'll build a distribution network that brings gas to every household. All of you who live here and who, who live in a, in a, you have a, an apartment or a flat a room here, you know, you're cooking with gas, right? Well, that was before 1959, it was not the case at all. People didn't even know what gas was, right? Well, it was a very important investment of the government to actually build a distribution network in this country to, uh, to bring gas to every single household. And it changed the nature of this society fundamentally. And up to this, this moment, up to this time, you know, the incomes from gas are very, very important in the Dutch economy. In fact, this country exports gas, Quite a bit of its production is actually being exported right, to the surrounding countries, Germany and Belgium mostly, but also to France. Right? And it's a very, very important source, source of income. Now, there was a very smart person, and he happened to be a geophysicist, King Hubbard. And he, he worked for Shell, and he was in fact the one who started understanding how oil moved from where it originally, these biomolecules were trapped in the sediments, how that actually became petroleum, how it migrated, and how it accumulated eventually. And Leverson, the person I said, you know, that's a book you really should be, uh, should be looking at if you're interested in this particular topic. He is one of the most important petroleum geologists who described many fields and through that description it became clearer and clearer how these systems worked. There's also sedimentology, the topic of sedimentology became more and more important because practically all oil fields are deposited in sedimentary rocks, not in igneous rocks, not in metamorphic rocks, but in sedimentary rocks. So it was important to understand the systems of of, of sedimentation, how sedimentary deposits were generated. And there were some statistics, some fun statistics, namely, for example, that oil field sizes are log normally distributed. So in other words, you have very few big ones and many large ones, and then as you go to the very small ones, you're, you're just tapering off again. But this is statistics that's not really very relevant, except perhaps to know that there's fewer big ones, big oil fields, than mid-size and smaller size. But that's probably not a very big insight. As we move on to the 1960s to 1980s, so just before you guys probably were born, and quite a bit, offshore drilling was developed, so that's relatively new. You know, drilling offshore is something, you know, very different than drilling on land and you need different technologies to go out there. There's also an issue of legal importance. Who owns the offshore areas? How far do you own it? Right? And so at that time actually, you know, there had to be agreements made about territorial waters and how you economic zones and what rights the countries have, right? As far as the oil is concerned. But of course, those you know, questions still play uh, an important role today, for example, when it comes to fishing. 
So this actually made uh, possible the discoveries in the North Sea, also in Libya, Nigeria, and some of them offshore, in Siberia, which isn't offshore, but that, that's most of this is onshore, and Mexico, the Golden Lane province, one of the biggest provinces in the Americas, and on very, very rapid decline right now, unfortunately. And so these are major areas that had been discovered during this period. Then we had the discovery of subtle traps. These are no longer the simple anticlines. You just have a layer that's like this. Now you had a little pocket somewhere. And one of the most amazing discoveries is the so-called North Dome or North Field in Qatar. It's a peninsula in the, sub in the uh, Persian Gulf. Right, and, and so uh, this is actually the largest gas field, gas field worldwide. And it's partially shared with Iran, and most of it is in Qatar. And uh, currently there's actually very big liquefied petroleum plants being built in Qatar to export this gas in the form of, of liquids to uh, mostly to the uh, industrialized nations. So that's actually not like a simple structure like this, but it's actually on the flank of a very big dome trapped in an area where there is higher porosity and higher permeabilities. And it couldn't move up because the same layer became tight going upwards. <clears throat> For the geophysicists among you, this was the big time when seismic started playing a, ma becoming a, playing a major role. So a vast improvement of se seismic acquisition and processing technology, it became the standard exploration tool with the exception of Russia, the Russians, they prefer potential methods such as gravimetry and magnetometry, and they have been very successful with that. So it took them quite a while actually to adopt seismic as a uh, major exploration tool. Further drilling improvements, construction and logging improvements, I won't go into detail about that. And then since 1980, to conclude on this here, so that's within roughly your lifetime. So called passive margin plays are discovered. This is where continental plates end, terminate, and pass over to, to oceanic crust. And that's typically beyond the shelf edge. Shelves, you know, that's continents underwater. And then you have a fairly steep drop-off. It's called the continental rise. And that goes into the oceanic basins, and that's actually a different type of rock. Typically below that, it's you know, typically granitic on the continents and basaltic in the oceans. One couldn't really drill that deep initially, certainly not at 3,000 meters, but not even on the slopes. But it was also considered perhaps areas of lesser importance as far as petroleum is concerned. But in this time, there were actually significant discoveries on the continental slopes, and now we make very, very big discoveries on the ocean floor at 3,000 meters and beyond, right? And this actually started here. So the Gulf of Mexico, West Africa, and Brazil, they became very important oil provinces. So deep to ultra deep drilling technology, and then we mean water depth, but also drilling, total drilling depth. They were developed. Very big, surprisingly big carbonate fields were discovered. This was a surprise to everybody because we thought, well, we found all the big fields. All that's left is really, you know, the small ones. Big potatoes, we all punctured them. The small ones, we didn't, so we have to go for that. And as of a sudden, very big fields in Kazakhstan were, were found, so-called Perikaspian oil province. Fields like Tengiz, the Tengiz field, and the, um, uh, what's it called, the Kashagan field. Uh, and so forth. So there's still ongoing. These are very difficult fields to find because there's a very thick salt layer above them and the geophysicists among you, they know that one of the things that you don't like is shooting seismic through salt because you have very strong reflectors both at the top of the salt as well as at the base of the salt. So the signal that actually goes through to the layers below is usually quite weak and so you don't really see much of the structure below. And all of these fields are below very thick salt deposits so they're very difficult to see. Well the first field that was actually discovered was by the Russians using gravimetry. That's a Tengiz field in Kazakhstan. Because if you have a big limestone plug below salt gives you a very distinct gravimetric signature because salt is much lighter than limestone 
And so you see that. Whereas with a seismic, you have actually great problems seeing that. And so never ever discount these methods, right? And, and the Russians were partly right to insist for a long time on this method because the success proved that they could find extraordinarily large, large oil fields. 3D, 4D seismic were developed mostly because of advances in computer technology. You could handle the data, but also, you know, if you had to acquire 3D seismic, you needed to know how to position all these streamers and stuff like that that I know very little about, right? But what you get is actually a volumetric picture with a 3D seismic and 4D seismic, that so-called time-lapse seismic, you repeat 3D seismic a few times, then you get a dynamic, you know, time-dependent picture of the reservoirs, and so that actually led to a very important insight as called seismic stratigraphy, and I believe some of you or all of you will actually take a course on seismic stratigraphy because it is one of the major exploration tools these days that allows us to find and explore for oil. Now what we do today, there's a very important uh, development here that petroleum disciplines had been integrated. Before it was like the geologists had their, you know, their place somewhere in a building and the geophysicists and the petroleum engineers and the drilling engineers and whatever else was, and of course the legal stuff, the staff and so forth. They all had their di different departments. That's no longer how most oil companies work. They work in so-called asset teams. You put one geophysicist together with a geologist, with a petroleum engineer, with a petrophysicist and a, uh, um, and a reservoir engineer, and they have to work together and they have to understand each other. And that's why we believe in all courses, certainly here in Delft, you have to understand, the geophysicists have to understand what, how the geologists work and vice versa. And they have to understand how the petroleum engineers work. If you don't, you won't be able to do a good job in these integrated teams. Because after all, you're all looking at the same system, but you lose dif use different technologies, right? And so it's very important to be able to com communicate because every one of these groups actually has an important contribution to make. Of course, computers helped in doing that. Now, we just looked, uh, looked at it and, you know, at the reserves, and you could perhaps, in a very simplified manner, say, we've probably produced roughly half of the easy oil, maybe one-third, you know, for the optimists among us, maybe a little more than half, you know, we don't know, the last word hasn't been said on that, but that's roughly the situation we're in. But there's plenty of other oil that's much more difficult to find, much more difficult to produce, and, and some of it is actually extremely difficult to produce, and that's still, still down there somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Uh, you said uh, sedimentology is the, the focus here in uh, studying the geology, but um, I've heard some people say that uh, they found oil in the cracks of Yes, yes. So the question is, um, have, is all oil found in sedimentary rocks or uh, is actually some, some oil, or does it actually occur in igneous rocks or in metamorphic rocks or so-called hard rocks, the way you call it. Yeah. So the answer is yes, yes. And actually some very big fields have been found in, in, um, in granite. And the best known field is actually the white tiger field in Vietnam which again has been found by the Russians, again using gravimetry and magnetometry, because nobody actually was foolish enough at that time when they found it, which was 1980s or 1970s, to think that you might actually find oil in, in granite. But they did, and it's a highly productive field, and there's many others discovered since. But if you look at the reserves, you know, the total reserves that I showed you, then actually less than 1% of the oil is found in these kind of rocks. They have, you know, oil in basalts in, uh, in India, in China, I've worked on a, in a field, in volcanic rocks, in rhyolites and, and, and related rocks and so forth, but these are hugely exceptional fields. They exist, they're fascinating to work with, but as far as the total reserves are concerned, they are less than 1%. Isn't okay. Well, I can't go into details because that's not the topic uh, here, but we will discuss more of that later on in the course. Okay, thank you very much. Now, there is one announcement, actually. I uh, just checked with the secretary, and he's got eight books left of the Petroleum Geoscience, 
uh, volume, and uh, we we offer them to you at thirty dollars, thirty euros. Sorry, we're in Euro country here. Thirty euros. They're actually the official price is sixty-four, so you can buy them. So first come, first serve. Okay, I see you next Wednesday.